the bottom line is uh, my sister was married to Kim Hankel. I was doing a, a children's play in Chicago at the Goodman Theater. Two shows a day, six days a week for $75 a week, clear. Which comes down to like $12.50 a show or something. And Kim called me up and said they were, I, I had met him once, you know, at the wedding and I had met him another time. Didn't know him that well. And uh, called and said that he had written a film and they were doing it and he thought there was a part in it for me and could have come down. I immediately that afternoon went down and quit the play and uh, made arrangements to go to Texas. Cat. And uh, I remember going to the Dr. Bella Itkin, she was a Russian woman who was uh, the producer of this children's show, to go down and get my two weeks notice. And she asked me what the film was. <laughs> I told her, and she asked me what the part was, and I said it was a heavy makeup role. And uh, she had this Russian accent, which I can't do. But, and she also had like one eye that went off weird, and there was always sort of a little something running out <laughs> over here. And she said, Roddy McDowell would have never done Planet of the Apes if he hadn't been an established actor <laughs> first. That's what she said to me. I said, fine, I'm giving my notice anyway, and I went to Texas. I was doing a show, we were doing a movie up in uh, Columbus called The Wind Splitter, which I had a part in. I was a father of the young hippie that went to California and came back, and the town hated him because he had long hair. So uh, there were three roughnecks in it, and one of them was Toby Hooper. He was in the movie. And the movie came out, and it didn't go very far. I got a call one day from Toby Hooper in Austin. He said he was in the, I didn't even remember him. He said he was uh, going to do a movie and would I like to be in it. And this was Chainsaw. <laughs> oh, I, I thought you was in a hurry. <laughs> and we got back to UT about five minutes late for a class. And they were tearing into the building, and they said, hey, where are you guys going? Are you going to try out for the movie? And we said, what movie? What are you talking about? And they said, well, they're shooting this movie. I said, where? And they said, in, in that room right there. It was one of the main theaters at the UT Drama Department. And we said, sure, like they're really going to make a movie here with us. Sure, you bet. And so we poked our head in the door, and somebody said, you know, are you here to read for the movie? And uh, it was Toby Hooper. And we said, well, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, oh, the, the movie, sure, yeah. So he said, come on in. And he said, he looked at me and he said, um, took his little cigar out and said, um, can you be weird? And I said, <laughs> weird is what I do. And my friend said, oh yeah, 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 he gives good weird. So they said, okay, get up and be weird. So they handed me the script and it had one of the little scenes from the, the, the hitchhiker in there. And, um, the minute that I begin to read the dialogue, I knew this was my nephew. I have a brain damaged, uh, paranoid schizophrenic nephew, and this is the way he talks. And uh, I said, my God, it's Paul, my nephew. I said, I can do this. So I did Paul, my nephew. And they told me to go out a cigar. I said, wow, that's great, that's great, that's great. So then they called me back a couple of days later and said, well, you're doing some real interesting things there. Uh, 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 you want to make this movie or what? Well, why not? The summer that they started shooting, I had, in fact, run into a guy uh, that who played in Of Mice and Men with me. And uh, that's how I got involved with Chainsaw, was that we went in to have a cup of coffee in a drugstore, and this guy who was a friend of his <clears throat> saw him and came over and joined the conversation and then told me about this movie they're shooting and that they were still casting for the uh, the killer I called the the casting director who was Bob Burns doubling his casting director in addition to doing his uh, the effects and uh, I went down and met him and talked to him for a while and then what happened was uh, he just said that uh, He'd call me, you know, they, they had other people to talk to. And so I figured that was that, you know, they weren't going to call me. And, uh, about two days later, he called me and said he wanted me to come down the next day to meet uh, the director and the writer. So I went down and met Toby and Kim. 
and uh, they asked me, you know, they, I came in and they d told me what the movie was and what the character was about and, and asked me if I was violent <laughs> and I said no and then they asked me if I was crazy and I said no and then he said, well, can you do it? And I said, sure, it sounds really easy. So they said, well, okay, you got the part. And then two nights later, we had a cast meeting and I signed the contract. And that when I signed the contract, Toby told me that he'd actually decided he wanted me when I came in the door because I'd filled the door. I was told, and I don't know if it was Toby as much, and Kim Hankel was, I don't know if he was credited for it, but at the time he was co-director, co-writer of the film. At least when we were working on it. I don't know how it's credited, but uh, somebody told me they were looking for an embryonic, an embryonic old man, somebody who sold their, they'd reversed the cycle and they were, you know, an embryo. And uh, the other specific direction I remember getting is uh, during the uh, finger sucking scene with Marilyn. One of them, either Kim or Toby, saying, "Have you ever seen a child nurse before? You know how when they get excited, they they start. You know, could you try? You know, maybe try that." I think he wanted to leave one halfway sane person in it to get the thing across and uh, to keep it from being complete mayhem in there. What are you doing? You got no need to worry. No. Now, now, you just cooperate, young lady, and we'll have no trouble. And when we first started that scene, not the scene in the truck, but the one in the uh, barbecue shack where I'm beating Marilyn up with the club, that was, that was hard. I, we started out, I couldn't do it. And they'd keep telling me to make it look real, hit her. Hit her, and they couldn't use anything fake because that looked fake. Uh, so I'd start. And, no, you gotta hit her harder. Hit her some more. Marilyn said, hit me, don't worry about it, you know. Of course, here I am, we, every time we'd try it, she'd come out with a few more bruises, and finally I got, got with it and started really, had fun doing it, started really slugging her. And uh, uh, we kept that up, we did it, uh, we did eight takes on that. And when he said, uh, it's, it is, we did eight, eight shots on it. He said, when, that, when it was a take, she just fainted and dead away. <laughs> Poor girl was beaten up pretty bad. The Hitchhiker is, is one of the, you know, one of the wackier members of the family. He's um, there in left field. He's in the outskirts of left field. He's further afield than they are. He, um, he was always envisioned as the one that um, was, you know, the furthest that that could go, you know, like, like if the family had been inbreeding, he's like two generations of inbreeding rather than one, you know, like, like Leatherface is probably one, you know, but the Hitchhiker's probably two. You know. He's the, his father's and, you know, his father's father is probably his father, you know. We're not real sure where he came from. He has this weird birthmark, you know, what the heck's that all about? Come here, you nap-haired idiot! No, no. Where are you at? I've been out on the road. You damn fool, you almost got caught over a dude. No, no, they didn't see me. They don't know nothing. I told you to stay away from that graveyard. The scene where Cedar was chasing me in front of the truck and the artsy fartsy lights behind and all of the smoke coming up, it's not even smoke, it's dirt. I mean, it's, you know, in, in, in L.A., they would, they would be on a sound stage and they'd have just the right amount of smoke. Well, this really works because it's all natural elements here. You know, it says, I'm groveling in the dirt. The reason I'm groveling and trying to get down into the dirt is because the stick that Sea Dow was punching me with was made out of hardwood. And he's beating me up, you know, and I can hear my skull cracking inside my head. And I'm going, ah, ah, and Hooper's over the side going, that's great, it's great, that's great, great stuff. Give me some more of that. I said, and, you know, in between takes, I'm going, Mr. Hooper, I think, you know, my, my ear is bleeding because this is like a hardwood thing. Could, like balsa would be good to do. We can dub the sound. No, 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 it's, let me see. And he would walk over and he would hit his hand with it. Nah, it's okay. 
I said, no, hit yourself on the head with it, creep. <laughs> That's where it hurts in your head, it hurts. You know, and so, but, so we finished the scene. We did like three or four takes with this hardwood stick. <laughs> but what bothers me about that is to have gone through all this pain and then virtually have this thing in black and white, you know, where you couldn't, you know, you don't see any of this, you know. There's no great close-ups of this, of this hardwood stick coming down on my face, you know, which I could, you know, if it was on camera, would have been fine, but nobody even knows, you know, they don't know. Originally, we had planned to have the character speak at least some sort of gibberish that had some meaning. So we had gone through the character, through the lines, so that I knew what the meaning was supposed to be. And uh, of each time, you know, the lines each time that Leatherface tried to speak. And, and when we did it the first time, Toby stopped that and said, no, that was too rational, that, uh, that, that Leatherface wasn't that verbal, he couldn't talk. And, and so we cut all that out because, because it, from Toby's perception of what Leatherface was like. So he really defined Leatherface in a lot of ways. I think the, the way I defined him for myself was that in preparing for the part, I, I went to the Austin State School, which is a, um, a home, a large campus for uh, retarded persons. And I spent several days walking around the campus pretending I was a, was a student there and, or an inmate and, and uh, trying to pick up the physical mannerisms of the way some people walked. I, I, I didn't think there was really anything else I could do because I, obviously if the character really doesn't have many lines and is there really only as a physical presence, I thought that was really the only way I was going to be able to define the character anyway. So I, I spent enough time there to try to learn how to walk a certain way that I felt in some way presented the sort of mental state of this guy. And I went to a friend's farm for a while and watched his pigs and tried to get him to squeal. <laughs> Since I was supposed to squeal like a pig, I never did. I, I never could figure out a way to do it. So the squeals and grunts that, the, that you hear at the early on is really just, it's dubbed in. It's not, it's not me at all. Uh, the only sound I make is that sort of groaning scream there when I killed uh, Kirk. Oh God, the infamous dinner scene, Lord. The dinner scene stands out in my mind as probably the most intense, the most incredible, fantastically creative, labored, Pregnant, you know, it's all of these words rolled into one. I mean, here was this table, right? And all of this action going around and around this table, which took like 30 something hours to shoot with the same group of people. And this, there was, here was this table with this sausage that had been on this plate for two and a half weeks for continuity purposes. It couldn't be moved off. And they had these lights at about 8,000 degrees Fahrenheit shining down on this stuff. And the stuff is decomposing in front of your eyes, like four inches from your nose, right? And here's a guy off, off stage with formaldehyde, literally, literally, you know, I don't, formaldehyde, putting formaldehyde in the sausage, trying to keep it from exploding on the set. You know? And then there's, there's this chicken head, right? Like Burns had this great idea. He takes his chicken head, he cuts the head off the chicken, nails it to a board, right? And then he nails the feet to the board and made a little chicken out of it. Looks great, but that sucker was just, I mean, rotting right in front of you, man. And I mean, we were also, in the, you know, Says, don't do that on camera. We can see on camera, wrinkling your nose. <laughs> wrinkling my nose, I'm about to projectile vomit all the way to Peoria. Come on, what are we talking about? But they had things over the window to keep the light out because, you know, because the light outside is going up and down because we're there over almost going into the second day, you know, so we got a few light changes here, you know, different times of the day. So they got these black things over the windows. And there's no air. It's an old German farmhouse built in the 20s, and there's no ventilation whatsoever. Everybody's puking and pissing and moaning, and uh, and we're going. We're never going to be done. This is going to go on into infinity. <laughs> and this is, you know, because a lot of these people, you know, couldn't see the end of the tunnel. Man, they couldn't even. They didn't even remember anymore how they got onto the damn train. Now, now, young lady, you, you just you just take it easy there. Now, but we'll we'll fix you some supper in a few minutes. Huh? The heat was oppressive. It was it was awful. So I guess we're shooting day for night or whatever. So it was supposed to be nighttime, but it was but actually we were shooting around the clock at that point. But it was hot, and with the lights it was even hotter. And the the all the meat that was on the table, and the dinner sequence started 
sweating and cooking and the flies and the smell in the place is unbelievable with all the bones in the front room which was right off the dining room there and you know with the heat and there was this mangy chicken they had in a in a uh, in a bird like a parakeet cage they had a chicken stuffed in there <laughs> the smell was awful gunner smelled awful just I probably smelled bad. The smell was just overwhelming. <laughs> they ran long, long hours, and especially the last day we shot that last series. That thing ran 26 hours from the time we started till the time we quit. Everybody was, that was that dinner table scene. Ugh, that was rough. And we had, they had all those meats and stuff, and, uh, and the skeletons wired with the light bulbs. Well, first the skeletons started burning from the hot light bulb in it. And if there's, you think that's a bad smell. Ooh, that's terrible. And then toward the, had all this, and it was hot up there, just hot as the devil. And they had all these meats, cold meats and stuff that were, they started going bad and smelling. And that was, yeah, people ran outside and had to go out and regurgitate and come back in. And, it uh, it was a little hairy there for a while. I mean, I don't know how we particularly got pumped up for it. I, I remember it as the hardest scene to shoot because it was part of that 26-hour shooting session. And we had to shoot that long because Grandpa, uh, we had only three faces for him. So we had to shoot everything with him in it in three sessions, and that was it. So. Uh, we had to do that dinner scene that, that day. It was a real long scene to shoot because it was a long scene, particularly as we originally had it. I mean, I think it's something like five minutes long, and we had to shoot enough angles on it, and we had to match the shots close enough that we had a lot of takes. We actually shot the movie, I think, in a pretty low ratio, but that, that scene, the, I, think, I think the ratio was, was higher. Uh, because we had to get it exactly right each time, and we had to time it out well each time. I think it was easy to get into the spirit of it because it was daylight outside at that point, so we were now probably 18 hours into shooting. Uh, we'd, it was something like 105 degrees outside. With the windows covered, we had blankets uh, over the windows to make sure there was no daylight coming in and, and we had all the lighting in there and the, um, the entire crew in there. You know, it had to be 115 degrees in that room or hotter and the food was rotting fast. We had to keep changing the head cheese because it would start to turn right away. I mean, you know, an hour into the shooting and it was smelling so bad we had to switch it out. And uh, so I think it was very easy for the scene to be very intense because we were all overheated and we all smelled bad and you know and the food smelled awful and you know and, and I don't I probably nobody liked each other at that point anymore you know so so it was easy to squabble and fight and well as I said you know that was the scene where I finally lost sort of forgot myself and, and got very involved with with killing Sally I mean I had that moment when 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 Ed is yelling kill her kill the bitch and uh, where I'm thinking, yeah, you know, let's, let's get her, let's get her, let's get this over. Get her! Hit this bitch! It was like its own major amphetamine, you know, it just got crazier and crazier and crazier. You know, you're sitting here at four o'clock in the morning talking about hitting people in the head with hammers. What's the best way we can depict the hammer coming down the back of the head? I mean, these are grown men sitting in a room discussing this like it was some kind of, you know, uh, uh, scientific tenant that they're working on here. You know, where, where, where we should have the hammer? Well, what, what angle are we gonna have that it's gonna fall into the bucket just right? It's a grown men sitting in a room talking about hitting a woman in the back of the head with a steel hammer. And people sitting calmly going, yes, I think that'd work. Unreal. Actually, until we got into that <sighs> dinner sequence, I don't think anybody involved knew that I was even in the film, or very few people. I was, I roomed with uh, Lou Perryman, he was now Lou Perry, who was the assistant uh, director or a second camera, maybe, on the film. Uh, we roomed together in Austin. When he found out he was 
room with me said, oh, you're in this film? Because they hadn't started shooting my scenes yet. Because I'd been out on the set and I was doing, running errands for Toby, picking up props and things. And he said, I thought you were just a little observer. It was fun. It, uh, it's a lot of fun to run around like that. <laughs> Not a, just, just let yourself go and do that. It really was. Leatherface has three faces. For the dinner scene, he put on what we called the pretty woman face. And I think the idea was that he was all dressed up and this was a big dinner party, so he was going to you know, put, put, be on his best behavior. You know, he taken grandma's apron off. He wasn't in his domestic role anymore, and so he wasn't playing grandma anymore. And he, he puts on the pretty woman face. In that very long dinner scene, uh, when they're getting ready to kill Sally, uh, what happens is, and what was cut out, was that Leatherface gets up during a lot of that fussing around the table and wanders into the neighboring room and puts on makeup. And there's a shot where he's, I mean, the face is already made up, but he starts really slathering on the lipstick and the rouge and stuff. And I think you can tell if you look at the face the first time you see it and then look at it later when he's running out the door that there's a lot more lipstick and rouge on the face than there was at the beginning. And I guess the idea was that, that Leatherface is so, that he almost takes on the personality of the face that he's wearing. You know, that that's whatever personality the other face has is, is whatever mask he happens to have on. And the idea was that he was going to be, you know, all primped up for dinner, you know, and his big, his, you know, they had, they were having guests for dinner. <laughs> There was one particular scene that was perhaps one of the most difficult scenes to shoot in the film, which was cut. The hitchhiker has, has been run over by this massive, huge 18-wheeler truck, and he's, he's been tossed unceremoniously about 50 feet in the air and flop down on the side of the, the hot Texas road, lying there in a heap. Well, in shooting the scene, there they were. They had me lying on this, uh, the, you ever seen these things on the, CNN where they, you know, I'm here today in Peoria, and they take the egg and they dump it out of the, the glass on the sidewalk and it starts to cook and everybody gathers around and says, wow, the egg is actually cooking, you know, because the, the asphalt is so hot. Lying on the asphalt, I could hear, I could hear in my ear, which was right next to the asphalt, right next to the skin, I could hear my own skin cooking. But being very young at the time and not having the sense to stand up and say, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> my skin's cooking here. Being a young actor and trying to do the right thing and keep the production going, I lay there on this asphalt until my skin cooked. Because what they were doing was they were waiting for a cloud. They were, you know, remember now there's a, there's a .001 mile an hour wind, you know, nothing happening, right? And this cloud is moving in front of the sun <laughs> ever so slowly. Well, because the light doesn't match the previous scene, they have to wait for the cloud to go away from the sun so that that light will match the light that they use in the previous scene. Well, so everybody's sitting here and waiting for the cloud to go away. Ed is laying on the, on the asphalt, 450 degrees Fahrenheit, and his skin is cooking. And I thought, well, gosh, it looks, and, and oh, oh, I, forgot, I almost left out. There's a woman with about four gallons full of payroll syrup blood pouring it into my mouth every 10 seconds so that it will ooze correctly. Because I've been, now my jaw's been broken, right? by the impact of the truck. And the only way that they could get the jaw to look right was to prop it up with something. Well, in the history of B-grade movies, we don't want to get some kind of expensive $400 mouth joist, so use this flat rock, which is more or less round on most of its edges. And they cram this underneath my jaw like this to give it that look of a broken jaw. So we've got the jaw being protruded through with the rock, we've got the Cairo syrup in the mouth, we've got the 450 degrees Fahrenheit things, and then later I find out they didn't use the scene. First time we shot Gunnar and Ed bringing me down the stairs in my rocking chair, uh, we hadn't really tried it out. And I was like, oh, let's go get Grandpa. And then Leatherface and, and the hitchhiker run up to get Grandpa, and they're carrying me down. And I don't remember who was on the bottom and who was carrying the top, but whoever was on the bottom was moving faster than the person at the top could move. So the chair slanted down 
And I was just not supposed to move. I was supposed to be like, you know, zoned out. And I started sliding because the chair was like on a 15 degree incline. So I started sliding, and sliding, and nobody says anything. Toby doesn't say to cut. Danny Pearl's still shooting. And uh, the guys are still going down the stairs. I keep sliding, sliding, sliding. Finally, I slide just like, you know, completely out of the chair. And still nobody says anything. <laughs> So they stop and, and whoever, I think it might have been Ed at the bottom, was trying to stuff me back up in the chair and finally the three of us, the actors, started laughing and Toby said, cut, cut, he says, I, you know, print that, I'd like to see it, it'd be good for the outtakes, ten years from now we'll get a kick out of that. There was a problem in figuring out how to do it because she was wearing such short pants and she had a halter top on. So what they ended up doing was they made a harness for her out of uh, nylons, out of stockings and she wore it around each leg and I think around her waist so that that she would carry the weight that way and then from the harness they ran a wire up her back for the for the hook to go on to so what would happen is that you know you show we shot it so that looking at it from above you see her being picked up and up her back approaching the hook then I put her down and she put the harness on and we, we flipped the hook around so that the hook wasn't pointed at her. I picked her up again and we threaded the, the loop on the harness onto the hook and I picked her up well past the hook so that the next angle from behind me over my shoulder, when I bring her down and it looks like the hook sh brings her up short, what's happening is the, uh, the harness is just catching the bottom of the hook and that stops her short and it looks like the hook dug in. Uh, and it really works because uh, I still wince when I see that scene, I, I, even knowing how it's done. And, you know, I, I think it's a good object lesson in filmmaking is that it's, it's horrifying and gruesome not because you ever see the hook go in, but because you see her reaction to the pain of the hook. The implication in Chainsaw is, is one of its strongest things. I have won bet after bet after bet of uh, people who have seen the film once, maybe twice, uh, betting me that you see the hook go through the girl. You do not see the hook go through the girl, but they will, of course you do, the hook goes right through, it was a great shot. You see her setting, him setting her down on the hook, but what your mind does is finish the image. It finishes it, you know, it finishes it for you, your mind does. It's inevitable if you have any imagination whatsoever. And so they'll bet me that, and they, they also bet me that, um, that you see um, Paul Partain cut in half in the wheelchair. You never see anything except Leatherface. We shot that scene with a metal sheath around my leg to keep the chainsaw from cutting into me and then put a, a a stake, a, taped a stake down and taped a blood bag over that and then actually cut into the into that. And they originally, what, when they told me they were going to do was, when they explained the, the scene to me, they were going to have one of the crew use the chainsaw on me. And they were going to, I'm going to fall on a mid shot and it cuts to a close up of the chainsaw cutting into my leg. So they said, well, we'll just have one of the crewmen run the chainsaw. And I said, no, that I would run the chainsaw because I didn't trust them to know, you know, when they were going to cut into me. So we did it and we used it, we used the chainsaw with the teeth cut off and it didn't work, it wouldn't cut through the pants. So we had to redo it with the teeth on the saw to be able to cut the, the, the material. And uh, that's a real, that shot is very real to me because when we shot it, uh, the saw cut very quickly through the, the cloth, the, the blood bag, the, the meat and hit the metal sheath and burned through it. I mean, it didn't. I mean, it heated up the metal sheath and burned me. And for a quick instant, I thought I had been hit with the chainsaw. And I let out a yelp and pulled the saw away and grabbed the spot because I thought I'd been cut and looked down as this spurt of blood comes up through the bag, through my fingers from the blood bag. And it was all quite real and, you know, it worked very well. In fact, uh, a friend was on the set for that scene and she got so cranked up during the scene that when, uh, it had been on the set long enough to, I think, pick up some of the lingo so that when, uh, when uh, 
that shot was finished, she yelled out first, it's a print. <laughs> and Toby sort of looked up at her and nodded and said, yes, that's a print, and we used that one. No, it was hard for me to do, to start. It really was. I just couldn't get into beating somebody with a club, but tried enough, and they keep yelling at you, yeah, go ahead, so I really got with it. And then the truck scene followed, and uh, uh, of course that, uh, I don't know why they did that, we were, when we were, we were to rehearse it, there was nothing in the bag, and they, nobody was in it. But then they wanted to start shooting it, they put a girl in the bag. <laughs> yeah, that took a while to get used to banging her, and so it came out all right. I hope you're not too uncomfortable down there. <laughs> And here's where we show just how far this guy will go. I mean, he grabs a knife up and he cuts his hand, you know, without, at a moment's notice, you know. Um, Self-mutilization has is, is always uh, intrigued audience people because uh, as an audience, when you see somebody blown away or shot or with all of the pyrotechnics that we have at our disposal now. It's just more movie making because we've been brought up for years and years and years to accept that. But self-mutilization, particularly on a bare arm, you see, is it, it, it's almost documentary-like because it, it's right there in the palm of his hand. There's no cutaway. He's, it, it, it's a simple theatrical trick, but still. It looks very immediate and very real, and it's very large, and it's right there in front of the camera. The guy who did the makeup, Dr. Barnes, I think was his name, was a plastic surgeon. He wasn't really a makeup guy. And uh, he had made two masks, liquid latex. And so the second time, the first time they put it on, it took him seven hours to put the makeup on alone. And then we shot for 12, maybe. In the second time, they only had one more mask for me, which they cut up into sections, put on in sections, but with uh, spirit gum. And uh, so the second time, they wanted to shoot myself and Jim Seedow out because they couldn't afford to pay Jim anymore, and they didn't uh, have a third makeup mask to use for me. So I was in makeup for, I think, 26 hours, and this was, Texas in July, <laughs> it was really uncomfortable. They couldn't change my clothes. We had only one set of clothes for me. And the shirt had been run through a washing machine with, a, with some dye to get it the right color for the, for the film. So we couldn't even wash my shirt because we were afraid, or they were afraid, that the color would change. And we couldn't have the suit dry cleaned because they were afraid that if, you know, if, if the dry cleaner lost it or anything happened to it, uh, we would never be able to replace it and get it to match. So. I had to wear the same clothes throughout the entire shoot, and that including the shirt. And at that point, you know, we're three weeks, three and a half weeks into the shooting, and I know that there was more than one person who did not like to sit next to me when we had dinner because, you know, I, I think I was pretty right myself. Yeah, the script was just a bare outline almost. And uh, uh, there's one scene in there that you. Uh, they claim has become famous is that i don't know that line where i say look what your brother did to the door look what your brother did to the door yeah he got no no pride in his home it's supposed to be a great great historical line in movie making now <laughs> but, uh, that just came about uh, running around there and so well, might as well lay it on so we laid it on of course Ed and Neil and I we had the we had the parts to do it with I have to admit unless you have a tremendously good script you know unless you have a Kasdan or a Brooks or somebody like that writing you a really good script I have to admit if I have my choice put me out there on that set with no dialogue at all where it simply says in the script Hitchhiker runs up and grabs Sally. Now that's all it says in the script. But, you know, and you could have a hundred different guys run up and grab the girl. But my idea was to whip out my razor and instead of grabbing her, trail behind her, whipping with the razor behind her. Instead of catching her, he just cuts her to ribbons.
earlier in the shooting, when we were shooting the chase scene in the woods, I was wearing, throughout the whole movie, I was wearing cowboy boots, which <clears throat> they had put new heels on so that they were very high to make me taller. I mean, I'm 6'4", and they, I think, with the heels, I was something like 6'7". And so I was wearing these boots that had slick leather soles and very high heels. And earlier in the shooting, I had fallen. Uh, the, in fact, it's on the film just before that, when I'm running through the woods and Leatherface does this little skip in the woods. The reason for that is that I was just getting ready to turn. The, the trail that I was running on turned sharply there. And I figured somehow that my boots were going to dig in, and so I did that quick skip to dig my feet in to make the turn. And when I turned, the, the, my feet went out from under me, and I landed on my back, and the chainsaw went up in the air and out of the range of the lights, and I couldn't see anyway very well out of the mass, so I rolled over and covered my head and waited for it to land. And uh, so because of that, and I think the fright we all got from having this running chainsaw land beside me, in the scene where I'm chasing her to the house, the only way I was going to make that turn without falling down was to do that little turn and sort of Keystone Cop sort of skid to, to make the turn and go around. I'd end up over at Toby's apartment with Kim in the middle of the night drinking beer, and they were rewriting constantly, constantly through the whole thing. And I do remember them uh, one night sitting up and drinking beer and trying to figure out, trying to write a scene to get Marilyn's blouse ripped off. <laughs> Just because so, but everybody was so enamored of her <laughs> torso, let's say. Which never came across because, believe it or not, Toby was worried about rating, about being able to get it on television. I remember going into to the first time I went to see Russia's, and, and uh, Toby had uh, it was Danny Pearl who was first camera on it. Had him taping off the Steenbeck, you know. And I said uh, to I guess Lou Perryman, I was there. I said, what, you know, why is he doing that? He says, we want to see what it's going to look like on the, when they cut it down for TV. I said, well, <laughs> if he thinks he's going to get this thing on TV, he's nuts. There were a couple of times when I felt very strange. It was, it was inevitably late at night. It would be like, you know, 2, 3 in the morning. And I'd be sitting there getting made up. And in the still Texas night, you could hear Marilyn screaming. And it was just a real strange kind of, I'd look in the mirror and there was this strange person there with a huge face long purple red birthmark on his face and sores all over his face. And I had this big knife and this, you know, screaming and the sweat and the air was just absolutely still. And then Gunnar would come in from having shot and run back and forth, being a large person, running back and forth for hours, uh, almost physically exhausted, uh, sweat pouring from every inch of his body. Uh, and it was, it, it became kind of uh, Twilight Zone-ish. You know, now's my turn to chase her. You know, now's my turn to do this. And a great many of your actions being based on more or less actions you've never done before, you know, it becomes in your imagination. How do you complete that image in your mind for the camera, for whoever, of what it is they're asking you to do? And it became very unreal at times, you know, and, and I thought, gosh, you know, um, as you look down and you see the ropes that you've just tied around a Marilyn Burns, a friend, an actress, but all of a sudden a non-real thing in front of you that you've been asked to jiggle up and down, truss up into an immovable mass, uh, where do you stop? You've been asked to do it as well as you could do it 
to the highest pitch that you can do it at, and the higher pitch you get it to, you see all the faces of all of the other actors and all of the crew people and the director and the assistant you know, manager, and, everybody, and they're all there. And the more you do it, the more excited they get in a kind of voyeuristic kind of sense. But when you look down and you see the flesh of the act is separating because the rope is too hard, and there's nothing she can do about it because she's tied in the chair and there's a rag, ma a ga rag gag in her mouth. You, there's a little tiny light that goes on in the back that says, hey, wow, we need to back off this sucker or what? When you're involved with a project like that, particularly if you're visible like being the killer, you get blamed for a lot of society's problems. Uh, so there have been all kinds of complications. I mean, just looking at that complication, I, a number of years ago, Probably in 1975, maybe 76, very shortly after the film had come out, I was at a chamber concert, and uh, this, during the intermission, this Philadelphia dowager comes up to me and is talking and says, you know, Gunnar, there were 12 people murdered today in New York City, and it's your fault. And, you know, I, I, you don't, you know, you're sort of made speechless by a comment like that, but I think a lot of people think that movies like that are the cause of a lot of problems. Um, when I think they're symptomatic of some societal issues, and, and I, to my mind, uh, though I'm no psychologist, uh, probably harmless, or at least let people work through some misery. So I get a lot of that. I'm not a lot, but I get some of that. People who, who think somehow I'm supposed to feel responsible for you know a lot of the misery in this world. And my answer is that uh, the misery is there, and the film simply you know uses that misery. And I think still to this day, it's not that violent a film. There's not there's very little blood and death that happens in it. I think, particularly compared by today's standards, you know, I don't think there was at that time either. That, I think that the the one scene when I first saw it, you know, uh, I saw it at the Chicago Theater on State Street in Chicago, and uh, the first time I saw it in the theater, and about 20 of us went. We all met there and we had a party afterwards with Bloody Mary's big <laughs> opening night party for Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the big punch bowl filled with Bloody Marys, and uh, the scene where a lot of people got up. And that's a big theater. And started walking out was a scene where Terry McMinn gets hung on the meat hook, which I still think is probably the most the most violent scene that happens in the film, because when Paul gets killed, it's all from behind, and you know, this stuff, but it's all, and it's all shot from behind. And uh, Bill Dale gets you know hit on the head with a sledgehammer and shakes around a little bit, but there's no you know, you know the cow entrails of the bag with the. You know, none of that stuff happening. The way they keep saying it was the forerunner of the modern day horror films, and it led to a lot. And it's, uh, it was great being in on it. Uh, uh, never, uh, you never, they never let you forget about it. Shoot, uh, you could have been in, uh, could have been in Gone with the Wind or something and tell somebody that God would have wind out of So what, what you mentioned, Chainsaw, Oh, there. The thing still lives on. Really, it just lives on and on. Used to get, uh, oh, we used to get calls from all over the, the country, from England, from Germany, from how they found out where I lived or my number. One time I thought of, after that show came out, of getting an unlisted number, because, boy, I was getting calls that were just, man, how did you do that? Man, how did you? I'd ask him, where are you calling from? If it was Houston, I was going to hang up and leave town for a while. Being that caught up in it, and never, and never, of course, seeing the film as a whole while we were doing it, being in the middle of it, I don't think we ever really realized what we were making. I mean, I didn't realize it because I was just, you know, some schlep on the, on the set. I wasn't, you know, I didn't have this overview. I didn't, I didn't know what Toby's notion was or his vision was. So I don't think I ever realized sort of realized what what this film was going to be or what it was what we were making and the thing that helped us a great deal was the 115 degree texas weather which uh by the time you got you know 
pound and a half of sweat in your eyes and your mouth and your nose and your clothes were all sweaty and you had, they hadn't been washed in six weeks. It got easier and easier and easier as we took all the environmental aspects of the family to become the family. Easier and easier. We were around the kind of food they were eating, we were around the clothes they wore, we were in the smell they were in. I mean, it was in the air. So it became easier and easier and easier. I uh, feel sad that uh, I didn't make any money. <laughs> also, in 74, there was a, in France, there was a t-shirt going around with my picture on the front of it. You know, I was like a cult hero in France, Grandpa. So the popularity worldwide is unbelievable. And I got a postcard or a picture somebody took in Tokyo of the mar a marquee in front of a, I don't, I don't have it anymore, I don't know where it is, but a marquee in front of a theater where like Grandpa was the whole thing, this huge picture of Grandpa. You know, so it's not just in this country, worldwide it was uh, a pretty amazing phenomena. When I read it, I read, well, it's a Class A, B drive-in movie, you know. And uh, I didn't take it too seriously. I didn't even dream the thing would, nobody dreamed the thing would come out like it did. And uh, no, I was just there. I was having a lot of fun doing it. And, uh, and really, it, uh, I didn't have any great uh, expectations. I, I didn't think it'd even get, get to be shown, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I figured it was one of these movies that you know, two or three years from now, uh, there'll be a few horror film freaks who really like this movie because it's gruesome. And that would be it, you know. And it would be right up there with Bucket of Blood or, you know, one of those. So I really didn't expect anything to happen. Plus, it was more than a year before the film was released. It was released in October of 74, and we shot it, we finished shooting in September. We shot it in August and the beginning of September of 73. So we spent a year waiting, and we uh, we had virtually given up. I mean, we thought maybe there never will be a movie, you know, that, that this is all, you know, it died somewhere. And we were actually a little bit surprised when they got in touch with us and said, we're having this press party in Dallas, will you come up for it? Once the film was released, again, at first, it was just a movie. I mean, we had a party for, this, for the screening, for the premiere, which we got into for free because we convinced them that we had been in the movie, you know, and they, they let us in. And, um, I don't think I realized that this movie was going to have any long, long-term effects, any lasting effect, until a couple of weeks after the film came out, I went up, I took a friend of mine to show her the house and that we'd shot this stuff in. And we, and we pulled up and walked over to the fence and we were standing there looking at the house. And this car pulls up and three teenagers get out and they walk over to the fence and they're looking at the house too. And one of them turns to me and says, you know, that's where they made that movie. And I said something like, oh, oh really? You know? And then they got in, drove off. And that's the first inkling I had that, that this movie was going to affect people. Well, my life wasn't uh, affected by Chainsaw right away. It was only after it became uh, a cult movie that uh, it began to affect it. And it's, you know, it's like, it's something that you just will live with for the rest of your life, you know. It's not like you can stop being the hitchhiker. It's like, it's, well, I don't want to be the hitchhiker anymore because that's, you know. But it, it's real interesting because now um, there are several um, producers, directors, who think, oh, that's all he does is those kind of roles. When that's the only thing of that nature besides Future Kill, which was an a direct outgrowth of having been in Chainsaw. You see, I would never have done Future Girl without having done the Chainsaw role, see, because it was offered to me because of the Chainsaw thing. Right? But, uh, for example, very few, a, a lot of casting directors that don't know me 
not from the Southwest, because the ones from the Southwest know, but you know, other people from other parts of the country, are astonished to find out that I've uh, done uh, you know, ABC TV movies with Mary Hartley. I've got uh, commercials running on world's greatest commercials. I have uh, done three and a half years with a comedy group called Esther's Follies, six shows a week, all sold out. You know, they're, he does comedy, you know, that kind of, but uh, wow, you know, it's great. You know. But it's, it's, it's uh, once you get typed, you know, it's very difficult, if, especially if you do it correctly. Well, in fact, uh, on Chainsaw 2, people would come by wanting autographs from, change one, from Chainsaw 1, and fellas that had these huge, beautiful posters that I had never seen before that were made in Germany, in France, in Italy, uh, you know, in, uh, with our pictures on them, all in German, <laughs> all in French. I saw one, uh, I saw one taping of it uh, with Japanese dubbed in. And you think we weren't funny with Japanese dubbed in. <laughs> she was showing it that way all the time. Oh, that was funny. When a friend of mine introduced me to a woman who was very impressed by the fact that I was a movie star, you know, big M, big S, and uh, wanted me to take her to see this movie. And I had, you know, real fantasies about where this was going to go. And, and of course, where it went was to a locked door. I mean, she, we went to this movie, and she was very delightful and excited. And, and I was all pumped up, thinking this was going to be great. And uh, we went to this movie, and I think as I put it in the article, she was curiously silent on the way home. And. Uh, was not very talkative and, and as we walked to the door said, thank you, I had a nice time, stepped through the door and slammed it in my face. And, and uh, I think at that point I realized that, that I wasn't going to capitalize on this movie. Sally, I hear something. Stop. Stop. It's always a amazement for one thing because I, I play a role that, for one thing, it's usually disbelief because it's like, yeah, yeah, anybody could say they played grandpa, you know, with all the makeup and everything. And then once they're convinced, it's just uh, amazed or admired. There's a guy that I just started working with, a new waiter that they just hired like three days ago, who I was, overheard me talking to one of the other waiters about you guys coming to talk to me, who said, are you serious? You were really in Texas Chainsaw Massacre? I said, yeah. I said, that is my all-time favorite movie of ever, you know? <laughs> I started asking me all these questions, pumped me for questions for like an hour. You know? So there, I get a lot of admiration. There are a lot of people who just think it's wonderful, you know, and don't understand why I'm not a multimillionaire. I think the popularity of Chainsaw is perhaps deserved because it was a creative effort on a great many people's parts, uh, from the production manager and the editor and the, and the cinematographer and the director and the script writer and the actors and the crew people. I think it was, you know, because you got to do more things on a set like this than you could ever even begin to discuss on a regular feature film. You know, you had crew members doing jobs. You know, there's a great deal of, of crossover, you know. And, and so you get to suggest things. Uh, uh, grips could suggest the lining up of a shot. You know, you can't do that on a regular feature film. You, you know, if you did that in Hollywood, they'd, they'd send two, two, uh, you know, uh, two guys out to take your kneecaps off and have them roasted for lunch, you know, that kind of thing. But so you have all this creative energy and all of these ideas and all of this stuff flowing together. And because there wasn't a big, long background of this is the way we make movies, see? There wasn't a lot of the cliches in there that you usually see. There was some very ingenious uh, working out of shot angles. Uh, uh, it was a very learn by doing kind of thing. So you get this kind of uh, documentary type style filmmaking because that's the only way they could figure out how to do it. So it looks very, you know, handheldish, very, uh, gee, they, they had a, uh, a TV camera out there that day shooting this weird family. It, it takes on a very, and you have actors that are uh, taking chances because there's nobody telling them not to. There's nobody saying, that's too much for the screen, you know. So it, 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 its popularity is based a great deal on seeing things that you haven't seen before. These, um, these, these characters are much more interesting, I find, much more real than the characters in Psycho. I mean, three-fourths of the characters in Psycho 
uh, the original cycle are, are cardboardish. The, you know, the, you got the woman, the, the, the people at the restaurant. You know what I mean? They're just, they're just your regular stock people. We don't care what happens to these people. These people aren't interesting. You know, Anthony Perkins' character was kind of interesting because he's not doing the same old stuff, and he, he was doing a great job in acting. But, but, you know, but outside of that, but, but, but the popularity, the chance, I've, I've seen people watch it that say, it, what's interesting to me is, uh, ooh, that's my favorite horror film, and I don't usually like horror films. I hear that over and over and over across the country, East Coast, West Coast, Florida, you know, all over the place. And what that says to me is that it wasn't made like a typical horror film, and there's something immediate there that these people are picking up on, see, that uh, isn't there in Blood Feast, you see? Uh, Blood Feast, this thing, you know, the, the Herschel Gordon Lewis stuff, which is, you know, interesting and fun and campy, but it's not real, you know. It's not real like Chainsaw is real. Chainsaw is one of the only real horror movies ever made. I don't know if they'll have another one or not, but I, no, I'd, I'd keep playing it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, uh, uh, of course, see, I can do all kinds of characters. I'm, I don't want to be stereotyped as, as that type of character. I'm, really, I'm a lover. Yeah, it won't hurt none. My old grandpa is the best killer there ever was. The other side effects, as far as the negative side effects of my life, I suppose, are the fact that uh, a lot of people think chainsaw jokes are funny. And believe me, after 15 years, chainsaw jokes are not funny. And I still get chainsaw jokes. I still get people coming up to me in bars making chainsaw noises or, you know, or calling me up at night and saying, you know, I want to talk about this movie when they won't even tell me who they are. And uh, I think that's sort of silly. Uh, a lot of people also think that I am the personality of Leatherface, that I am brutish, you know, that I'm, I'm you know, nasty, brutish, and tall, <laughs> and that, that uh, somehow all I did was call upon my inner self to, you know, and bring that to the surface to make this character, and that, that I'm some horrible creature, and, you know, and, and, and that, that, that they're not going to let their children come to my door on Halloween. You know, I've got about 20 minutes on camera there, at least. Don't say a thing. Don't do a whole hell of a lot. But I do it well. I do it very well. <laughs> sort of like now, my life. I don't do a lot, but I, I do. It's quality. But it really isn't the biggest thing in my life. So I guess it's because people think that if you do something you're well known for, that fame is what defines what's important to you. I mean, I don't know how to say that well, but that if you do something that people recognize you for, that whatever you do after that that's not public can't be as important. And I think that's unfortunate because that's not the case. I mean, Doing the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was certainly not the biggest thing in my life, either personally or professionally. And I'm glad I did it. But I don't want it to be the center of my life, and I think it is for a lot of people. I mean, people always bring that up as somehow the big thing. And to me, I think it's unfortunate that I'll probably be remembered for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre before I'll be remembered for anything else. And I think that's really unfortunate. Uh, they will probably say Gunnar Hansen, he was Leatherface on my gravestone. You know, I didn't uh, see the Chainsaw Massacre uh, the first time around, uh, off and out of the country. And by the time I got back, it was gone. So I had to wait uh, four or five years till I had a revival of it here on Hollywood Boulevard. So by then, it had become kind of a cult classic and uh, since I've seen everything of this nature since I was five and a half years old back in 1922 I thought it was high time that I catch up with it well I must say I was staggered by what I saw on the screen it, it was so realistically done that it seemed more like a documentary somehow or other to me than than uh, <coughs> a film of fiction I think it was probably a watershed work in uh, that it, it brought a, uh, a new dimension of reality to uh, horror films. Uh, uh, I say, uh, to, to me, it seemed as though it was really happening in that house and with the mad executioner and so on. And uh, I think many films have, uh, that have come on since have, have used that as kind of a, a blueprint for horror.